Hey guys, hope all is well. Um, happy Monday. Um, hope you guys had a great weekend. I know I did. Um, I went out, had some partying. Uh, it was fun. Um, in this video, um, this is the second installment of a series that I started last week, uh, which I dubbed Chess Secrets You Wish You Knew. And um, in this video, I'm going to essentially address weaknesses, specifically pawn weaknesses. So, uh, in addressing the pawn weaknesses, um, I'm going to first state this contention, and then you're going to have to roll with this. So here's the contention. Any move you make with any piece, you're moving it away from squares that it was previously defending. I repeat, any move you make, you were moving it away from squares it was previously defending. That's the nature of chess. It's a give and take. Now, this is all the more important with pawns. And the reason it's all the more important with pawns is because it isn't checkers and they can't move backward. And so as a consequence, uh, when you make pawn moves, you really have to be wary of the squares that you're weakening. And here's the rule of pawn moves. When you push any pawn, you're weakening the squares directly adjacent to the new square it lands on and the square that it just left. So if I play b3, I'm weakening the a3 square, the c3 square, and in my opinion also the b2 square because it can't actually go back to that square. Um, some people don't maybe not agree with that. They might say the square just left is not such a weakness, um, but I tend to actually point that out as well. So b3 would weaken a3 and c3. A move like d3 would weaken c3 and e3. Um, uh, g3. Uh, for instance, we can f3, h3, and g2. Um, uh, if black responded by playing h5, well, that would weaken g5 and g6 um, and h7. So with that background in mind, uh, you can understand how uh, you, there really can be irreparable consequences to pushing your pawns. And so the challenge when you're playing chess is to go forward but to not leave too many weaknesses behind or not weaknesses that can be exploited because the truth is every move you're weakening something. And so that's part of the give and take. And uh, the great ones, the great players are really good at doing this and not creating weaknesses that can be exploited. Um, and so in this game, I'm not going to show the whole thing, but I just want to explain just how uh, a few weaknesses here and there at the pawns can ruin a position. So, uh, in this game, uh, Ulf Anderson, a very talented Swedish grandmaster, once I think top five in the world, um, uh, played this guy Marcelo Tempone. And you could see just how bad it gets uh, so quickly because of this understanding of pawn weaknesses. So I'm not going to go too much into the opening, but we're going to zip through. C4, knight f6, knight f3, g6, knight c3, d5. C takes d5, knight takes d5, e4, and now here's the beginnings of a Grunfeld, um, if you're curious about the opening, but I'm, I'm not going to explain it too much. And after knight takes d3, normally the move is b takes c3, because normally we learn capture towards the center, um, so that you can you know, have more control of the center. But here, Ulf Anderson played d takes c3, and it's a very unique system. Uh, uh, the point being that after queen takes d1, king takes d1, uh, white can't castle, um, but has uh, slightly better control of the center at the moment and a surprisingly flexible way of developing the pieces by just putting the king on c2 and the bishop on e3 and uh, getting a very interesting and uh, queenless middle game. And uh, again, my, my idea is not so much to go so deep into the opening here, but to sort of emphasize uh, where... Uh, the weaknesses are and where the critical points are. So here, if you look at White's position, White has played c3 and e4. Um, if you look at the weaknesses that were created by those pawn moves, it's uh, uh, both moves really did weaken the d3 square. The thing is, though, is that that's effectively controlled by the bishop on f1, and if the king goes to c2, it's also controlling the d3 square. Um, the other squares that are weakened, if you look at by the c3 pawn move is maybe b3. Um, but that's effectively covered by the pawn on a2. And again, if the king goes to c2, it's not a problem. So 
White here has push pawns, but there are no real weaknesses that can be exploited. Um, now, if you look at the black side, uh, all black's pawns are on the original squares, except the G6, uh, the G7 pawn, which is on G6 now. And so whenever you fianchetto, and especially when you play like G6, the dark squares around can be a little bit loose. So G6, right, as, as a consequence of G6 right now, F6, G7, and H6 are a little bit more weakened. Um, and it's very important that you figure out what's weak and what's not, and what can, what can be exploited. Here, Marcelo plays c5, a very, very natural move at first sight, but actually awful. And the reason it's bad is because this, of this bishop on f8. The bishop on f8 would love to, uh, to be activated on, on an active diagonal, but the problem is, is that if you put the bishop on g7 here, um, so I'll just go back and say bishop g7, this bishop is essentially biting on granite. It's not influencing this diagonal at all because this pawn on c3, coupled with this pawn on b2, is blunting the bishop. And there's no real scope for it here. So the naturally, the most actual, the longest diagonal, the, the most active diagonal the bishop could potentially be on here is actually on c5. And by playing pawn c5, you take away the deployment of that piece from that square. Additionally, c5 creates oh, weak weaknesses. So based on what we said, now the light squares that are decked directly adjacent to the c5 pawn, b5 and d5, are both loose. And here's why that's a big problem. The e7 pawn is the only pawn that can, can cover that d5 square. But the problem is, is if you play, if, if, white, if black ever does move the e6 pawn, you're not really in great shape because... Uh, let's say black plays, well, black actually did play, or excuse me, white actually did play bishop e3 here, attacking that pawn. And let's say black played, oops, sorry, I'm, let's say black played e6 here. Now you're creating more weaknesses, and you can see d6 is weak and f6 is weak because of this g6 move, uh, which Fianchetto. So now they're, you're trying to compensate for this light score weakness on d5, but in the process you weaken d6 and f6. So really already, the c5 move, you can see it's very difficult to defend that pawn and not create more weaknesses. Uh, and again, if the e pawn doesn't move, the black e pawn doesn't move, the bishop on f8 is sort of dormant. So uh, black played here b6. And b6 is again another really, really awful move because it really fixes the... Uh, it really weakens more of the light squares on the queen side. So if you play b6 now, you're weakening a6 and c6. And Ulf, super alert to that weak, the, this, these weaknesses, decides to fix them by playing a4. A beautiful move, which fixes uh, black's queenside pawns on the light squares, and means that whenever he wants, he can also create this lever, this pawn lever, by playing a5. And already, we're only nine moves in, but the structural damages uh, that white has sort of inflicted on black uh, are really, really uh, harmful and mean that uh, black's pawn structure cannot be repaired, even though there are no double pawns here. Just the, the weaknesses created by, uh, by black's pawns here are just uh, something that cannot be recovered from. And so this is already much better for white. And so if we look, knight c6 was played, Bishop b5, great pin effectively covering more lights, the light, exposing the light square pushes. Uh, bishop d7, king c2, really beautiful move, connecting the rooks, covering b3 and d3, which are potential white weaknesses. Bishop g7, not developing uh, the wrong diagonal for this bishop in the system because it's just restricted on that diagonal. Rook h d1, tying the king on e8 down to the bishop on d7. A6, another huge, huge weakness, because now after A6, you're kicking the bishop away, but you're weakening the B6 pawn. So after this bishop drops back, now this B6 pawn uh, is really a problem, because if that ever moves, then the C5 pawn would be hanging. So it, just the whole queenside structure is fixed, and you see the difference in the health of the white and black pawn structure. And already this mission is, is nearly lost. The bishop takes F7 as a threat. Already here, rook takes d7 coming. Um, so black has to 
move the bishop yet again, bishop g4. And after h3, a uh, brilliant move by Ulf Anderson, just trying to get rid of those light squared bishops. Bishop takes to f3, g takes f3. White has double pawns, yes, but it's where the weak squares are here that matter. And the weak squares are on the queen side, these light squares, b7, c6, d5, d7, and then coupled with the the fact that the dark uh, the fact coupled with the fact that the squares on the queen side uh, are fixed, particularly the queen side black's queen side pawn structure means that the position is irreparable. And already here, uh, I would evaluate this as a pretty much near losing position, if not completely lost position, for black. So I'm not going to go through the rest of the game. Um, actually, I'll show a few more moves. Uh, castles f4, rook a7. E5, A5, really another awful move, but a sign of the times that uh, he's willing to give up even more light squares uh, for the destruction, uh, for because he was afraid of A5, and now the destruction of the queen side will ensue in a very beautiful way. Um, rook D2, E6, again weakens D6 and F6, uh, rook A D1, and already here it's over. The bishops are active. Uh, the rooks are doing a great job on the d-file. And these light squares, b5, c6, c4, and even d6 are really big-time weaknesses. And, um, yeah, uh, the finish was beautiful. If you want to look up the game, you can do that. Uh, Ulf Anderson versus Marcella Tempone in 1979. And uh, you can find it on chessgames.com. And, uh, yeah, uh, again, every time you move a pawn, you're creating weaknesses. So being cognizant of those weaknesses is super important. So that's a primer on, uh, on pawn weaknesses. And uh, I hope now, um, well, you've, uh, you've learned a chess secret that you always wished you know. Anyways, be, be back soon with more.